Welcome to Book Banter with me, your host, Diane Burkhart. I hope you will join me every Wednesday as we explore all things to do with, well, (laughs) books. Let's get on with our show today. Hello, my happy people. Today is March 20th, and we are getting closer to the end of our love fest. This has been so much fun. We have had some incredible authors come on to help us begin season three of Book Banter with Diane Burkhart, your book talk podcast. Now, today we have the very hot and spicy romance author, Eve Black. Her Savage Raiders Motorcycle Club book series is just hot and spicy from the get-go. If you go onto Amazon right now, check out Savage King by Eve Black. You can read a sample from that book. This, I think, will give you a very good idea of what she brings to her books because it is hot and spicy from the word go. Seriously. I have actually taught safer intercourse practices for the American Red Cross before. So I've had to discuss all kinds of different topics with strangers in public. I do not get embarrassed. But when I was reading these sample pages from this book, even I was like, oh my goodness. Okay, yeah. She definitely has the right touch for doing hot and spicy romance. If that is your thing, be sure to go check out her books. But wait and do it after this interview because I'm sure you're going to find some very interesting information. She was a wonderful interview and she bailed me out. I needed a hot and spicy author to round out the love fest and she stepped in. So please welcome to Book Banter with Diane Burkhart, Eve Black. Now, today is going to be a little bit different than my usual interviews because usually I do a lot of prep work. I read some of somebody's book, but my guest today stepped into a slot at the, and I do mean last minute. (laughs) I had a cancellation and she was gracious enough to step into the spot with like no notice whatsoever. So we're going in blind. So this is going to be a new thing for me. So I just really want to thank you so much for being a part of the show today. Can you please explain to my listeners who you are and what you do? My name is Eve Black, and I write sexy contemporary books. But mostly the highlight of what I do is I write books that feature plus-sized heroines. And the genres I write are motorcycle club, billionaire, paranormal, small town. But in each and every book, the heroine is larger than a size 12. I try to bring a little bit of love to the curvy woman. You know, and I was reading through some of your reviews today on Amazon, and there was one that I saw that somebody totally lost their mind because you have a plus size heroine. Yep. Yep. And it's, it boggles my mind because you look at women, especially in the Western countries where food is plentiful and it's not always the best for you. And women eat. We're eaters. We're not always going to chomp down on a salad. We're going to have that burger. And a majority of us aren't, you know, I include myself in that, aren't small. We're we're larger, we're plus size, we're not we're not all morbidly obese, but a good majority of women in the U.S. on average are larger than a size 12. I'm an avid reader, and I was reading through all of these romance novels, and I just, as much as I loved the stories, I still got a little heart sick because I couldn't put myself into the heroine's mind, into her situations, because I she wasn't like me. Mm-hmm. You know, she wasn't bigger. She didn't understand, you know, thigh rub and boob sweat. And, <laughs> you know, she didn't understand that she might not necessarily fit on the back of a motorcycle or squeeze under the cupboard in the kitchen like when she's hiding from a bad guy. Like, you know, I'm putting myself in these situations and I'm like, my fat butt would not <laughs> fit in a cupboard under a sink. So where would I hide? Yeah. So it pulls you out of the story. And I just felt 
you know, we always write about the guy with the six pack and the tree trunk thighs and the smirky smile and dimples or whatever. And we have these perfected men and these stories with these perfect women. And it's like, where is that man for someone like me? Mm -hmm. And I knew that I had to write that. And so that is my goal is to bring the curvy woman some love. And that's even one of the hashtags I use on social media is curvy girls need love too. So that is my goal. And you can freak out as much as you want about it. But I know that women around the world aren't always tiny. So there needs to be representation for that. Absolutely. And I'm, I'll admit too, it's like, I am definitely a plus size woman. And I've dated guys who were very fit. I have dated yeah. guys who were very athletic. Some of those guys actually like curvy women. <laughs> yes. I, you know, I've actually interviewed a couple of guys. You know, I asked them, would you prefer a woman who struts the catwalk or do you prefer someone with some curves, some some softness, some some cushioning? And I'm telling you, nine times out of ten, they would prefer the woman who was soft to their heart. Mm -hmm. something they could cuddle something they could wrap in their arms and they would fit perfectly they don't want the the angles and the elbows they want a woman who's like i said soft to their heart so the majority of the books have these not just skinny but tiny women i'm talking like five two size nine or size zero and it's like how is that realistic you know how many men actually want that so i need to represent real women, real American women in the size. You know, and that was one thing I had been reading this cozy mystery series for a long time. And the heroine was somebody who was chubby. You know, she wasn't overweight, but she wasn't tiny either. And she mm -hmm. had curly hair that was always a mess. And she was a little bit clumsy. And I loved all of that about her. But then they got a movie deal for this. And when they put her into the movie, she was thin and tall and blonde and perfect. Oh, no. <laughs> and it just really killed the whole story for me. Yeah. Yeah. That would ruin it. Definitely. And I don't seem to understand why there's this need to make everybody perfect. Because life's not perfect. People aren't perfect. Why is it so bad to represent people and life as and it real, is? Real women, real characters. And yeah, that's what I got frustrated about. I was like, how, how are these women me? How are they representing me? And it's not even just that I'm bigger. I'm also mixed race. But I'm like, where are the biracial women who are chubby, who have mm -hmm. the kinky hair, who aren't klutzy, they aren't naive. They are not bakers or florists. Yeah. Or, you know, I, I wanted real life representation of American women. And it was just so frustrating. So I was like, you know what? Okay, I'm putting aside this other pen name and I'm creating something else. And this will be my goal. This will be what I'm going to do to add something to the publishing industry. And so that has been my driving force. Well, and you seem to have a very good spread across several different tropes and genres. There should be something that everybody can find in here that they would be interested in reading. Well, I'd hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I write what I feel like writing. You know, there's a lot of writers who go, okay, I'm writing what the industry wants so I can make the money. But the thing is, is that's not how I read. So mm -hmm. that's not how I write. I write what I want to write, even if it doesn't make me 10 cents a month or whatever. I'm writing it because I feel like writing it. And most of the time, I'm not raking in the dough, but I'm not like, to me, it doesn't matter how much money I make as long as I'm presenting something to someone out there. Even if it's just one reader who can completely connect to my characters, that is what I want. So, yeah, it's across many genres. The characters are all different. The women are all different, except for the key thing being they are plus size women. Now, how long have you been writing your books? I actually published under my real name in 2012. And that was my first real journey into the publishing industry. But then I started self-pubbing in, oh, Lord, <laughs> 2016, I think. <laughs> In 2016, and I have written uh, 40 plus books. Oh, wow. 
And a majority of them, however, are in other pen names. Eve hasn't written quite so many, but, you know, I have, you know, as any author out there has entire notebooks full of different story ideas. And, oh, yeah. And it, it's not just that I write either. I'm not just part of the writing part of the industry. I've also done PR. I'm currently a, de- a developmental editor. So I edit other people's books as well. So I'm like immersed in it. But my favorite part is writing, of course, absolutely. Have you always worked in some kind of publishing industry position? (laughs) I've always done something in writing. Before I actually started in publishing, writing and fiction, I own my own copywriting business. Oh, wow. Um, Or I would take on... This is back when there was the, the huge SEO boom. Google was just this fledgling thing. Yeah. And people were starting to learn how to, to utilize SEO and keywords. And so I took on thousands of articles a month where I would just crank out these nonsense articles on things like lanyards and <laughs> uh, neuropathy and things like that. But as I went along, I was able to get more clients who paid more for less. And so I grew a reputation online for my copywriting. And I still do that occasionally. But that was right. Cut my teeth was starting my own copywriting business. So I've always been writing in my adult life. It's just now I'm actually doing something I'm passionate about. And SEO is still one thing that I struggle with so much. <laughs> Because I started learning computers as computers were being created and Mm -hmm. SEO came along much later. So that was a totally new concept to me when that came up. And I still have not figured out how to put it in with all of my stuff. I'm still working at that. I get it. (laughs) But it's not easy, but at least they've cleaned it up a little bit. It's not as frenetic as it used to be back in the day. Now it's more of a smooth process. (laughs) Because they have, yeah, they, have all these, they have all these tools that you can use now for it. I mean, I consider it cheating because I had to do it the hard way. <laughs> but, you know, they have these different software things online that they could use for that. But that's not me. I was back there in the beginning. That was one of the things. Like, I've been noticing some of those apps. I'm like, oh, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> because, <laughs> because seriously, they are so helpful to somebody like me who has no clue. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I get it. Now, how did you go from doing something like that to writing romance books? I've always been, always been a fiction writer. I can remember I wrote a story called Descriptive Island in the fifth grade, and I won the district writing contest. And I was like, okay, that's it. That's what I'm going to do with my life. (laughs) And I've always, and I, I started out writing poetry and short stories, but it wasn't until I got married. And then right after I got married, I got pregnant and I, it was a difficult pregnancy, and so I couldn't work. And so I was sitting around all day, and I'm like, you know what? And I've always been an, a voracious reader. It was either <laughs> Dean Koontz or a romance novel. Yeah. So my mom turned me on to romance when I was 12, and I read my first dirty book when I was 13. And there's just no turning back <laughs> after that. And so I've always been a heavy romance reader, and I was just sitting around one day, just depressed and upset and not really seeing how I fit other than just being this sad pregnant lady. And I was like, I got to do something. So I sat down on the computer, opened Word, and words just flowed out. And my very first story I published in 2016, and it wasn't like super great, but it wasn't terrible either. Mm -hmm. And since then, I've just done what I could to learn the craft and get better and help others get better and hopefully make it into a career that I can look back on and say, I lived an amazing life. What do you consider to be the easy part of your career? Wow. What comes natural to you? Thinking up the story ideas. I think that's easiest for anyone. You can be sitting on the toilet and boom, (laughs) and a story idea pops up, you know, the idea flowing and you jot down all these major points in the story. And the hardest part is sitting down in front of the computer and making it make sense. Mm Mm-hmm. And that's the part I struggle with the most. I have so many freaking story ideas and I generate at least two or three a day. And I'm telling you, it's frustrating because I'm like, oh, I got to get that. I got to write that. I got to write that. But I'm still writing something else. (laughs) So yeah, the easiest part for me is definitely coming up with things to write. What's so funny is I'm sort of the same way, only for me, it's projects like, okay, I've got two books that I want to write this year, but then I also have the podcast and I started a magazine last year. And whenever I was 
doing the magazine for the first few months, I was trying so hard to get books finished and do the podcast and do the magazine. And my husband was watching me get so frantic. And he was like, do me a favor. Do not start another thing until you figure this out. Mm, and yeah. I agreed with him. I'm like, okay, if I start another project, if I come up with some new idea, you get to slap me. <laughs> <laughs> It's like, because that's the only thing that's going to deter me from actually doing it is knowing that you will slap me if I start something else. He's just that like, is the, no. That's the way, that's the bane of the creative. It's having all these ideas sprout up. But then when it comes time to do the work of it, yeah, that's when it becomes difficult. Yeah. Oh, most definitely. <laughs> One thing that I do want to kind of discuss with you because I'm sure people will notice there's a little bit of a difference going on. I always post photos of people in the promos for episodes. Yours is going to be a little bit different. We do not have a photos, but we have your gorgeous author logo. And I just wanted to kind of cover why that is. As Eve Black, that is a pen name I write under, but I write under three other pen names. And I like to keep my persona separate specifically because I have family members who are conservative and they wouldn't necessarily be excited about people asking questions about, oh, she writes this. <laughs> and it's not that big a deal of me to just create something else because I'm a creator. That's what I do. So I created the persona Eve Black and I don't use my face just because I use my face with my other pen names. So I'm trying to keep the the wall there, the partition there to keep those separate. And I think there are so many authors who can identify with that, especially in the more spicy romance genres, because you yeah. do want to keep that separate from your life because too many people seem to focus on, okay, if you write like this, you must be like this and you get attention you don't want. Yeah, they don't understand the concept of fiction. Yeah, there's people do not seem to understand that line. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My books include cussing and sexual situations and LGBTQ. So it's not that they would hate me for it. They just wouldn't be exactly be proud of me for it. You know, and I don't necessarily want those parts of my life crossing because those are people I care about and I don't want them to feel awkward around me knowing what I do for a living. So it's not that difficult for me to just keep them separate. Well, you know, and even for people who like to read spicy romance, they're not always comfortable discussing spicy romance. Well, I mean, there's a whole market for the pretty covers over the Manchester covers, you know, the discreet covers. And while I say there's no shame in my reading game, I have no problem with the, the spicier covers. I'm not going to be reading those spicy book covers around my family. <laughs> yeah. So I understand the whole concept of discrete covers and people not necessarily being open about discussing what they're reading. So what is your latest book that you've published? My latest book was book three of my Savage Raiders MC series, and that was Savage Fire. Yeah. <laughs> that book, there's a little bit of a tumultuous relationship with that book simply because the hero in that book has a harem that he calls his beehive. And it's because he doesn't believe in relationships as far as one on one. So he has five live in girlfriends. But of course, it's just a straight up male female trope. So we know that going in, it's not going to be a menage of any kind. And let's just say the heroine, Tessa, is not okay with him having five live in girlfriends, especially since he wants to make her number six. <laughs> that doesn't go over well with her. And he realizes that he kind of effed up and trying to get this, this independent, fierce woman to be number six. <laughs> So yeah, there's a lot of readers who go, oh, he didn't grovel enough. She should have kicked him to the curb. But I'm like, you know, he can only grovel so much, but he stops becoming a man. So I believe that the grovel is sufficient. She saves herself, of course, because she's a plus size muscled MMA fighter. And so she's able to save herself and he comes in to, to help clean up and they have their happily ever after, even though she's still kind of mad. <laughs> <laughs> Book number three of Savage Raiders, which is Savage Fire. I really enjoyed writing that one. I had started reading the sample on the Savage King. I think that was book one in that series. Yes. 
Oh my God. I mean, right from the first few words, <laughs> it was just spicy hot from the beginning. Yeah. So you see why I ran under a pen name. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and, and I am fun. not like this demure little flower. I do not get embarrassed. And I opened it up and started me. I'm like, oh my gosh. <laughs> it's like, okay, <laughs> hold on. <laughs> yeah, that is actually um, my most popular book is that one. And I love writing that because first of all, the hero is a giant. He's six foot 11. He's massive. His club name is Odin after the all father of all the myths and mm-hmm. What I love about that is the heroine, Scavi, she is, I love this. I love this about her. She is not just this demure, tiny lady that you typically find in MC romances where the heroine is either this ball buster with tattoos or she's this demure girl who shies away from her shadow. Scavi is six foot two and she's also a Jaeger or part of the Royal Danish Special Forces. She's part of the Jaeger Corps. So when I did my research, I found out that there was only 155 Jaeger Corps active at any one time in the world. Wow. 155. And she was one of 155. That is how excellent this woman is. She's able to kill with her bare hands. And... I mean, think about it. She's absolutely skilled in hand-to-hand combat. And when these two meet, oh, the meet cute, (laughs) the meet cute that is not that cute because she basically laid out one of his club brothers because he was touching her friend inappropriately and didn't understand the word no. And she just takes him out just a couple of moves and he's out. (laughs) And Odin walks in the room. And he sees this woman crouched next to his club brother. And when she stands up, immediately, insta-love. The dude is in love because he was just complaining in his mind about how all these women just didn't fit him. And he sees this giantess who he just found out laid out his brother in a fight. And he's just in awe. (laughs) He's absolutely in awe of her. And the part that I love the most, though, that I wrote into that scene is, is she's leaving the club because her friend wants to go and Odin who speaks Norwegian. And so does she, of course, I mean, she's the inner court. She speaks four languages and he and his club brother, he's like, you got to tell me your name. And she's like, my name is Skavi. And the VP says a Norwegian, you mean like the giantess and the folklore. And she says in perfect Norwegian, no, like the goddess. <laughs> And then she walks out, leaving these two men like in awe, like, okay, not only does she just hear us and speak back to us in Norwegian, but she just like completely blew his mind. And that was the best mute cute I've ever read. I mean, I mean, I wrote it, but the whole book is like that, where she shows vulnerability because she's had a divorce and her husband cheated and all that stuff. She shows that she's a woman, that there's feminine parts of her, but She also goes into a firefight with complete skill and confidence. It also helps that she's not a size zero. She's big and tall. And that's what I wanted to represent was a big and tall woman who was vulnerable, but also could kick some ass. So that's what I went for with her. That's one of the things that I really do like about that character, because it's incredible how many people usually, well, both genders seem to come up with this idea, but It's just incredible how many people seem to think that women would not have any military knowledge, any knowledge of weapons and how to use them efficiently. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just really incredible how people just automatically assume that women are not going to have these skills. Well, it's a holdover from when women weren't allowed in the military and especially in active duty. They were the homemakers. They were the ones who were at home protected by the men. And I understand that concept, you know, because I would rather my husband learn to shoot than having me learn how to shoot because I'd rather be protecting my kids. But I wanted Stavi to be one of a kind and literally one of 155. And she's not only just this ex-mill, she's also the manager of a gun range. (laughs) Mm -hmm. she knows her weapons she knows her knives she knows her hand-to-hand combat i mean she's literally a living weapon that's what they're trained to be in the jaeger corps they're trained to be living weapons so i mean the the name jaeger means hunter 
So she's literally a hunter of men. And I just made her into this amazing above average woman who also happens to be large. So, yeah. How much research do you do whenever you start building characters like this? Or do you just go with fiction and create it? Or do you actually go for fact and do research? Well, when it comes to something like military, you know, there's military wives who read these books. So I'm not going to go in and make stuff up about an actual military group. So I did my research about the Jaeger Corps specifically for that. And of course, I had to research guns and the different types of body armor and the different types of hand-to-hand combat techniques. And I had to look up the different languages because she speaks Danish and Spanish and Norwegian and French and Italian and all these things like that. So I couldn't just blah, 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 you know, onto the page. <laughs> I had to I had to write what this was because I wanted people to be impressed by her. If they go, oh, I wonder if that's true. And they look it up and like, oh man, she really does all this stuff, you know. But I typically research as much as I can just because they're real life situations and these are supposed to feel like real life people. So I don't fake it so much. Where I mean, I make up street names and town names and things like that. But as far as real life things like military and guns and countries and things like that, I try to stick to as realistic as possible. Well, it seems like that's always one of the things that sidetracks me the most is research. <laughs> it's so easy to fall down a research rabbit hole. Absolutely. I, I can't tell you how many hours I spent <laughs> just clicking through the, the information ahead on the Jaeger Corps, just reading these things. I'm like, okay, there's no way I'm going to use this information in the story, but I need to know. And that's, you know, a part of being a creative is the yearning for knowledge. Oh, yeah, Definitely. Like, I have so many textbooks sitting around me right now. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> so now is the point of the show. We like to do five quick questions that never turn out to be quick, but we refuse to give up on the bit. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Are you ready? I'm ready. Question one. What are your favorite romance tropes to read? Second chance romance and other woman drama. Do you have a favorite author in those? Oh, Other Woman Drama is Erin Sanders. Her book, Pierced Heart, is my ultimate favorite. A Second Chance Romance, oof. I don't know. There's so many. <laughs> I would say Jessica Prince. She's got several Second Chance Romance books that I really liked. I don't remember the title. The, the hero is Patrick and the heroine is Mona. People are going to be Googling. <laughs> yeah. So those are my two favorites. And speaking of Other Women Drama, I actually created a Facebook group for that. Oh, yeah, I saw that. What is the, the full name of it? It's the Other Women or OW Drama Romance Group. It's a Facebook group. So anybody who's interested in those kinds of books can look that up. Yep. Come and find us. Question two. What romance tropes do you think are starting to become overdone? <sighs> Enemies to lovers and bully. They have to be done the right way or they come out glamorizing abuse yeah and yeah sure i love to read a bully romance where the guy is an a-hole but there needs to be some sort of pullback towards the heroine where he starts realizing there's feelings for her Mm -hmm. but if he's an a-hole through the entirety of the book and the woman continues to capitulate that's not romantic to me that's an issue i have i need to know ahead of time going into the book whether or not there's going to be a redemptive arc You know, is he going to change his ways? Is he going to realize that he's been an a-hole? Is there going to be groveling? Is she going to have a backbone? If he just made her lick his boots in the middle of the cafeteria, and then the next thing you know, she's giving him a BJ in the closet. Like, seriously? No. That isn't romantic to me. And when it comes to enemies to lovers, uh, my issue with that is typically make the women look like bitches. Mm Mm-hmm. You can be a woman who sees a man as an adversary without making her a harpy bitch. And there's a fine line between being independent and pushing back and pushing too hard and coming across as someone who the hero just needs to leave and and go find someone else. If I feel like he needs to just drop her and she's pushing too hard and she's not making anything easy and she fights over stupid things like which fork to use at dinner, it just becomes too much for me. At that point, I'm just done. And I DNF. I just can't do it. Well, you know, people are also starting to talk more and more about domestic abuse and, you know, how subtle it can be. And so I think you have to tread a fine line when you're doing those tropes so that you don't make it sound like, hey, this is romantic. 
then they're glamorizing it like you know women who are in domestic situations are reading it and going oh he's just being romantic yeah oh the gaslighting is just him showing he loves me <laughs> he just he just can't say it yeah so it is kind of a dangerous thing but if it's done well then hopefully the women who are in that kind of situation can go you know what what this book is saying is much better i'm gonna go find that you know yeah. so i think it should always be inspirational yes Question three, what is your number one most binged show on Netflix? <laughs> um, I'm currently watching a K-drama called My Demon, and I rewatch the episodes several times, and it's either that or Supernatural. I'm a huge Supernatural <laughs> fan. I love Dean Winchester so hard. <laughs> <laughs> Sure, Sammy is like he's Sammy is a sexy but intelligent, but Dean, man, he's such a badass. <laughs> he's a badass with vulnerabilities. So I, I yeah, I, I definitely been some supernatural, and I'm feeling in the need. <laughs> I'll admit, I just want his car. <laughs> oh yeah, baby is sexy, definitely. <laughs> Question four: I always have to play Homescapes on my tablet before I go to bed at night. What games do you always go play when you need to get out of your own head? Mm, I play Monopoly Go. Oh, um, yeah. I'm addicted to it. <laughs> I can be honest to say I put a little too much money into it. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I play that or Cody Cross, which is sort of a, a fill in word search kind of crossword oh, yeah. thing. Yeah, I play those. I love the animation that they have on Monopoly Go. Yes, those are so sweet. They're super cute and they're so fun. And you look forward to the next run of whatever holiday they're doing. So so question five, since you are a romance author, what do you do for Valentine's Day? Uh, nothing. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm a mom of four. So it's really hard to do anything romantic in a house full of kids. Yeah, we don't really do much. We're very much homebodies. So. I wanted to throw this question out there to all the romance authors because I wanted to show people because I know a lot of people automatically assume, oh, she's a romance author. They must always do something fantastic for things like Valentine's Day and their anniversary. <laughs> and No, but we're also moms and wives and girlfriends and we have careers and sometimes mm -hmm. we're just tired. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we're just tired. So we'll put on our sweatpants and sweatshirts and maybe grab a bottle of wine, even though I'm allergic to grapes. And I'll make myself a vodka cocktail and I'll sit by the fire with my vodka cocktail and read a book. And that's my Valentine's Day. It is me loving on me that day. <laughs> hey, that Kelf, it's like part of the things that we're focusing on in our book banter magazine for the February issue is self-love too. It's like a lot of people seem to forget about that, that sometimes you need to show yourself a little love. Especially when you have four kids. <laughs> yeah. I cannot even imagine that. I have two stepdaughters and they were pretty much grown by the time I came into the picture. So I got the easy part. <laughs> I can't imagine yeah. having four young kids in the house. Yeah, it's nuts. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything that you think that the listeners need to know about you that we have not covered? I just love books. I love reading. I love interacting with readers and other authors which is why I'm so active in the Facebook community, especially on my Other Woman Drama Romance group. And I'm just hoping readers find my books and that they enjoy them so much that they share about them, that they personally feel like they found themselves in my heroine. Like I said, that's my goal, is that women read and they go, you know what, I identify with this woman because she's so much like me. And uh, yeah, that's what I want. That's what I'm passionate about, not just about writing, but also creating characters that are realistic and represent real women. And I, for one, appreciate that. You're welcome. <laughs> so where can people find you and your books? I do Amazon mostly, especially through KU. A lot of my books are through Kindle Unlimited. But you can also find me to just chat me up on Facebook and TikTok and Instagram. I love chatting with readers and other authors. So come find me. We will talk. And what is your website? My website is eveblackbooks.com. And I will make sure to put links to all of these in the description of your podcast so people can find you very easily. Awesome.
Thank you so much for doing this, especially doing this at the last minute. You have no idea how much I appreciate that. It's been fun. It's been so much fun. I'm, I'm so glad to have participated. It was wonderful. So there you have it, folks. My interview with Eve Black. Be sure to go check out her social media and her website and try her books. If you are into hot and spicy, she absolutely will deliver. Now, don't forget, coming up next week, we have our last scheduled author for the Love Fest. We have J.R. Byer, the author of the Blackwood series. This is a historical fiction romance series with a little bit of paranormal to it. She has such good reviews and you're going to love this interview. So come back next Wednesday to hear from her. And we have a bonus romance author for you. She was originally scheduled to be part of the Love Fest lineup, but because of circumstances beyond our control, we had to reschedule her. But we managed to get together in time so that we can drop her in at the end of all of these. And on April 3rd, you will get to hear from Kushi T. Saha. She has a romance series, The Unraveled Duet. She likes to write passionate stories infused with love, and she is known for bringing interracial relationships to all of her stories. So be sure to come back on April 3rd to hear from Kushi T. Saha. Now, things that are coming up with Burkhart Books. I am working diligently on my next book, Free Bed Haircut with Each Craniotomy. It has been going so well. Thank you in part to my memoir writing group that I found on Meetup. And they have just been so helpful, giving me some direction. I'm really enjoying the process and I'm actually learning a lot about myself. I found out that I've been telling my own story wrong for 20 some years because I started going through the journals that I kept at the time that I was going through all of my brain surgeries and realized I had been telling people that I had been diagnosed with two neurological conditions, a Chiari malformation and syringomyelia. And then when I went into my first brain surgery, I acquired hydrocephalus. That's actually wrong. <laughs> I was originally diagnosed with three neurological conditions, Chiari malformation, syringomyelia, and hydromyelia. How I completely forgot about that third neurological condition is beyond me. And then I acquired hydrocephalus from the first brain surgery that I had. So I actually have four neurological conditions. (laughs) How did I forget about one? That just... It's a good thing I kept journals during all of the events going on at that time because I was suffering a lot of brain damage. I was on a lot of narcotics for pain issues. So I guess it's not completely unreasonable that there's a lot that I forgot back then. And just so you know, writing this book, I am verifying events and conversations with the people that I had them with checking it in my journal because I wrote a lot of this stuff down because I knew at the time I would probably need this information later and would not have the best memory considering everything going on. And I am doing my best to bring accurate information in this story. And so far, the people who went through it with me are saying that I did a good job. So that one will be coming up. Hopefully very soon, we're going to be getting together the cover art that we will reveal and I'm going to start sharing a little bit of what I've written. So we've got that coming up for our books from Burkhart Books. We also have some great things coming up for Book Banter Magazine. We're looking at changing the format right now, which hopefully for this next issue dropping April 1st, you will be able to download an e-copy of the magazine and keep it for yourself. If this works, I may look at going back and redoing the other ones, depending on how much time I have available since I've got a book to write to and keep up with the podcast and the magazine issues, I might end up just going forward with the new format change. We'll see what happens. I'm also looking at different possibilities of being able to get print versions available as a print on demand sort of issue. We'll see. I've got a lot going on, doing a lot of research, trying out different computer programs and apps, and 
We'll see what we can get done, but just keep coming back for more episodes of Book Banter with Diane Burkhart, the Book Talk podcast, and we will keep you up to date on all of the great things going on. So now you know what time it is, folks. It's time for you all to go forth, and hopefully you've got some great spring weather to enjoy where you are, and be really happy about it. 